Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. There is a challenging contrast between two of our Bible passages this morning. Maybe you saw it. You see, in our Gospel reading from Luke, chapter 20, and if you'd like to turn there, this is page 879 in the Blue Bibles, Luke, chapter 20, we hear Jesus tell a very pointed parable about Israel. In Jesus' parable, there is a vineyard, and it's farmed by tenants, it's farmed by by renters, sharecroppers, so to speak. But they refuse to share. They refuse to pay their rent. First, they beat the owner's servants when they come to collect it. And then, finally, when the owner sends his own son, they go farther. They kill him. Jesus says the the tenants murder him with the misguided hope that that if the heir to the vineyard is dead, well, then maybe it'll be theirs forever. But that isn't what Jesus says will actually happen, is it? Far from it. Jesus says, what then will happen? What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. He will destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. You see, in Jesus' parable in Luke 20, the vineyard tenants, they wanted it all, but they get nothing. Worse than that, they get death, destruction in the end. This is definitely a coal-in-your-stocking sort of parable, if there ever was one. And you know, the people that, that heard Jesus, they knew who he was talking about. He, they knew he was talking about them. You see, they knew Israel is the vineyard, and they are the tenants. Now, they knew this because Israel is repeatedly described in just these terms in the Old Testament. Psalm 80 uses uses a vineyard as an image for Israel, saying, saying of God, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations, and you planted it. In Isaiah chapter 5, we heard from Isaiah, I think, 43 this morning. But in Isaiah 5, Isaiah just says it outright. He says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. So there's not a lot of room to get confused about who Jesus is talking about. And we know. We know even beyond this that they understand just who is on the hook here because of how they respond to the parable right? Look at the second half of verse 16 here in Luke chapter 20. What do they say? Surely not. Surely not. They're saying, don't let this happen. The only reason they would say that is because they understand that they are not spectators, but they are actually in the parable, that the people this will happen to that will be destroyed will be them. But Jesus' point stands. Israel, he is saying, wants to cut God out of its own, his own vineyard. And they want to keep the vineyard's produce, its fruits, for themselves alone. And worse, worse, Jesus is saying that they will go so far as to kill God's son, Jesus, rather than surrender to God. But to repeat myself, in the end, Jesus says the tenants are actually the ones who will lose by this. Not God and not the Son. Jesus says he'll be vindicated. And he quotes Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's talking about himself there, rejected by Israel, but the cornerstone of God's work in the world. So that's the message. The message of Jesus' pointed parable in our gospel passage this morning. Just kind of keep that in mind. And turn with me now to our New Testament reading from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. It was on page 981 in the Blue Bibles. In this passage, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16, 
page 981. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but this is actually a sort of mirror image of Luke chapter 20, isn't it? You see, in Luke, the tenants in the vineyard are willing to kill the son so they can have the vineyard, yet they lose everything in the end. But here in Philippians 3, Paul says he's lost everything so that he might have the son. Look at verse 8. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You see that contrast there? And it's an interesting contrast. We'll talk about it this morning. But before we do that, let me say something about that word rubbish. That word rubbish here in verse 8. You see that? You see, rubbish is probably the least offensive possible translation <laughs> of what Paul is saying here. I see some of you have heard this before. To give you a hint, the rubbish Paul is talking about, well, it's not the leftover copy paper in that blue bin at work. He means something, shall we say, much more fragrant than that. Actually, it's dung in the King James Bible. And I think that gets us as close as we probably want to be to how Paul's statement would have been heard. Paul is making a really strong, almost coarse point here, isn't he? Yes, he says, he has lost all things for the sake of Christ, but he is not missing them. Far from it, they are literally crap to him. That's what Paul's saying. So what do we make of this contrast this morning, this strong, almost coarse contrast? What do we make of this contrast between killing God's son and losing everything anyway in Luke 20, and losing everything, but through that, maybe even in some strange way because of that, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Well, let's start... Let's start actually with what both passages say in common. So listen for this. This is what they say in common. You ready? You will lose everything. Seriously, that's it. Both passages say this. You are going to lose everything. Despite their most extreme efforts up to and including murder, the tenants keep nothing in the end, not even their lives. As Jesus says, everyone who falls on that stone, that cornerstone, him, will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. I know that's kind of a strange picture, but there's actually a great rabbinic paraphrase of this idea when it occurs in the book of Esther. And it says it this way. It says, if a stone falls on a pot, alas for the pot. And if the pot falls on the stone, alas for the pot. You get the idea. That's what Jesus is saying here. But at the same time, Following the Son, following Jesus, Paul reminds us, well, it doesn't mean losing nothing. In fact, the cost in earthly things can be high. I have suffered the loss of all things, says Paul here in verse 8 of Philippians chapter 3. Now, I understand. Having the preacher tell you that you're going to lose everything probably doesn't sound particularly uplifting this morning. I suspect some of us may even be thinking something like, well, Peter, I know it's Lent, but sheesh, you have to be so depressing. I could have just slept in. Well, really, friends, it's not as bad as all that. And it isn't as bad for two reasons I want us to think about together this morning. And the first one is just simply this. The fact that in the end we are going to lose everything isn't just some particularly depressing bit of uniquely Christian theology, is it? It's actually, it's actually something that, even though we don't talk about it much, we all knew to be true before we came to church this morning. You may have heard this, but we're going to die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. And what's the proverb say about that? You can't take it with you, right? So whatever your it is, you're going to lose it in the end. And that's a theological point that actually both Christians and atheists agree about. So first, we don't need Philippians or Luke to know that life costs everything in the end. It's common knowledge, even if we don't often admit it to ourselves. 
And secondly, I think it helps us a great deal to pay attention to Paul's tone here in Philippians chapter 3. You see, he doesn't sound like, like he thinks losing all things, his words, losing all things for the sake of knowing Christ has been some kind of terrible trade or a burden to him, does he? Far from it. Paul's message is actually the opposite of that, isn't it? He's saying that it is an exchange he'd make a thousand times. He'd do it with a smile on his face and a spring in his step. Knowing Christ, he says, it has surpassing worth. Surpassing is not a word we use a whole lot anymore. Think of it as passing worth. Worth that passes whatever you're driving and however fast you're driving. It's more than that. Remember, compared to knowing Christ, everything else is putting it very nicely, rubbish to Paul. So why does he have this perspective? What makes knowing Christ worth so much, both to Paul and, I hope, to us? Well, this is what Paul says about it here in the third chapter of Philippians. He says, when you know Christ, you don't just know him, and that's it. You also receive something of his, something something that you desperately, desperately need. Look at verse 9 here in Philippians 3. Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. In other words, Paul says, knowing Christ gives you the one thing, the sole thing that you can take with you, that you must take with you when you die and it is time to meet God. And that one thing is the one thing we can never manufacture for ourselves. And that's righteousness, rightness with God the Father. One of the things I love, I love about Paul and Paul's letters is that he sees himself so clearly in them. You see, Paul doesn't just see my need for a Savior, your need for a Savior. He sees his own desperate need for a savior as well. He knows, because he tried, friends, that he has not been able to be righteous, to be right with God. He knows that he has not kept all the rules and will not be keeping them in the future either, despite his best efforts to do so. He knows that if he is going to be righteous before God, it cannot be his righteousness, because he doesn't have it and never will. He sees himself clearly. He not only sees himself clearly, but he sees Jesus clearly as well. Paul knows, and he says so so clearly here in Philippians 3, that Jesus can fix this, that he is the Savior. That is what he's saving us from, friends, our own unrighteousness. That Jesus is the one he needs to know, that I need to know and you need to know, more than we need anything else. And then Paul, Paul acts on what he knows, doesn't he? Look at verses 13 and 14 of Philippians 3. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal or the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, Paul is not a window shopper or a website surfer who is always putting things in their online cart like I do, but never actually clicking the buy button. He doesn't just say, I wonder what it would be like to have that. He puts his money where his mouth is. He buys. He puts his life where his mouth is. When he found Jesus, he knew he had found surpassing worth. He had found a righteousness to replace his unrighteousness. And he was willing to go bust. He was willing to take everything he had built up to this point in his life. And friends, this was a lot. He was a respected man. He was highly educated in the system of the time in the Jewish world. And he was willing to set all that aside to know Christ my Lord, he says. And friends, he did this joyfully. He's not sad about this. And the question, the question these passages raise for us this morning here at Epiphany is who are we going to copy between these two passages? 
Are we going to act like the tenants in the vineyard of Israel and try to claim as ours things that don't really belong to us? And honestly, we know we can't take with us anyway. Or with Paul, are we going to see, are we going to see the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord? And not just see it and not just go, yep, that's really valuable. But act on it, buy it. That is reorder our lives so that everything in our lives, everything we have, all the plans we make are negotiable. They're up for sale, so to speak so that we might share in Jesus' righteousness when it's time to meet God. Or are we not going to do that? Are we going to try to take it with us even though we can't? Even though it's rubbish? Even though, like it was for the tenants in the vineyard, it'll be a disaster in the end if we do. Every day this choice is in front of us. How will we order our lives. Friends, we all live in the vineyard. This is God's world, not ours. It's not just Israel. Everything is God's. Chantilly, Virginia belongs to God. We live in a place that is not our own, but if we let it go and all that is in it, we can have a righteousness that is not our own in return. That's a good trade. As Paul says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Amen.